Section four of the Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers by Catherine Crow. Chapter four Allegorical Dreams, Presentiment, etc. It has been the opinion of many philosophers, both ancient and modern, that in the original state of man as he came forth from the hands of his creator, that knowledge which is now acquired by pains and labor was intuitive. His material body was given him for the purpose of placing him in relation with the material world, and his sensuous organs for the perception of material objects. But his soul was a mirror of the universe in which everything was reflected, and probably is so still but that the spirit is no longer in a condition to perceive it. Degraded in his nature, and distracted by the multiplicity of the objects and interests that surround him, man has lost his faculty of spiritual seeing. But in sleep, when the body is in a state of passivity, and external objects are excluded from us by the shutting up of the senses through which we perceive them, the spirit, to a certain degree freed from its impediments, may enjoy somewhat of its original privilege. The soul which is designed as the mirror of a superior spiritual order to which it belongs, still receives in dreams some rays from above and enjoys a foretaste of its future condition. And whatever interpretation may be put upon the history of the fall, few will doubt that before it man must have stood in a much more intimate relation to his creator than he has done since. If we admit this, and that, for the above hinted reasons, the soul in sleep may be able to exercise somewhat of its original endowment. The possibility of what is called prophetic dreaming may be better understood. Seeing in dreams, says Enemoser, is a self-illumining of things, places, and times, for relations of time and space form no obstruction to the dreamer. Things near and far are alike seen in the mirror of the soul according to the connection in which they stand to each other. And as the future is but an unfolding of the present, as the present is of the past, one being necessarily involved in the other, it is not more difficult to the untrammeled spirit to see what is to happen than what has already happened. Under what peculiar circumstances, under what peculiar circumstances it is that the body and soul fall into this particular relative condition, we do not know, but that certain families and constitutions are more prone to these conditions than others all experience goes to establish. According to the theory of Dr. Innemoser, we should conclude that they are more susceptible to magnetic influences, and that the body falls into a more complete state of negative polarity. In the histories of the Old Testament we constantly find instances of prophetic dreaming, and the voice of God was chiefly heard by the prophets in sleep, seeming to establish that man is in that state more susceptible of spiritual communion, although the being thus made the special organ of the divine will is altogether a different thing from the mere disfranchisement of the embodied spirit in ordinary cases of clear seeing and sleep. Profane history also furnishes us with various instances of prophetic dreaming, which it is unnecessary for me to refer to here. But there is one thing very worthy of remark, namely that the allegorical character of many of the dreams recorded in the Old Testament occasionally pervades those of the present day. I have heard of several of this nature, and Oberlin, the good pastor of Ban de la Roche, was so subject to them that he fancied he had acquired the art of interpreting the symbols. This characteristic of dreaming is in strict conformity with the language of the Old Testament, and of the most ancient nations. Poets and prophets, heathen and Christian alike, express themselves symbolically, and if we believe that this language prevailed in the early ages of the world before the external and intellectual life had predominated over the instinctive and emotional, we must conclude it to be the natural language of man, who must therefore have been gifted with a conformable faculty of comprehending these hieroglyphics, and hence it arose that the interpreting of dreams became a legitimate art. Long after these instinctive faculties were lost, or rather obscured by the turmoil and distractions of sensuous life, the memories and traditions of them remained, and hence the superstructure of jugglery and imposture that ensued, of which the gypsies form a signal example in whom, however, there can be no doubt that some occasional gleams of this original endowment may still be found, as is the case, though more rarely, in individuals of all races and conditions. The whole of nature is one large book of symbols, which, because we have lost the key to it, we cannot decipher. 
To the first man, says Hammond, whatever his ear heard, his eye saw, or his hand touched was a living word. With this word in his heart and in his mouth, the formation of language was easy. Man saw things in their essence and properties and named them accordingly. There can be no doubt that the heathen forms of worship and systems of religion were but the external symbols of some deep meanings, and not the idle fables that they have been too frequently considered. And it is absurd to suppose that the theology which satisfied so many great minds had no better foundation than a child's fairy tale. A maid-servant who resided many years in a distinguished family in Edinburgh was repeatedly warned of the approaching death of certain members of that family, by dreaming that one of the walls of the house had fallen. Shortly before the head of the family sickened and died, she said she had dreamed that the main wall had fallen. A singular circumstance which occurred in this same family, from a member of which I heard it, is mentioned by Dr. Abercrombie. On this occasion the dream was not only prophetic, but the symbol was actually translated into fact. One of the sons being indisposed with a sore throat, a sister dreamed that a watch of considerable value which she had borrowed from a friend had stopped that she had awakened another sister and mentioned the circumstance who answered that something much worse had happened for charles's breath had stopped she then awoke in extreme alarm and mentioned the dream to her sister who to tranquillize her mind arose and went to the brother's room where she found him asleep and the watch going the next night the same dream recurred and the brother was again found asleep and the watch going on the following morning however this lady was writing a note in the drawing-room with the watch beside her. When on taking it up she perceived it had stopped, and she was just on the point of calling her sister to mention the circumstance, when she heard a scream from her brother's room, and the sister rushed in with tidings that he had just expired. The malady had not been thought serious, but a sudden fit of suffocation had unexpectedly proved fatal. This case which is established beyond all controversy is extremely curious in many points of view, the acting out of the symbol especially. Symbolical events of this description have been often related, and is often laughed at. It is easy to laugh at what we do not understand, and it gives us the advantage of making the timid narrator ashamed of his fact, so that if he do not wholly suppress it, he at least ensures himself by laughing too the next time he relates it. It is said that Goethe's clock stopped the moment he died, and I have heard repeated instances of this strange kind of synchronism, or magnetism, if it be by magnetism that we are to account for the mystery. One was told me very lately by a gentleman to whom the circumstance occurred. On the 16th of August, 1769, Frederick the Second of Prussia is said to have dreamed that a star fell from heaven, and occasioned such an extraordinary glare that he could with great difficulty find his way through it. He mentioned the dream to his attendants, and it was afterward observed that it was on that day Napoleon was born. A lady not long since related to me the following circumstance. Her mother, who was at the time residing in Edinburgh in a house one side of which looked into a wind, while the door was in the high street, dreamed that it being Sunday morning she had heard a sound which attracted her to the window, and while looking out had dropped a ring from her finger into the wind below. That she had thereupon gone down in her night clothes to seek it, but when she reached the spot it was not to be found. Returning, extremely vexed at her loss, as she re-entered her own door, she met a respectable-looking young man, carrying some loaves of bread. On expressing her astonishment at finding a stranger there at so unseasonable an hour, he answered by expressing his at seeing her in such a situation. She said she had dropped her ring and had been round the corner to seek it, whereupon to her delighted surprise he presented her with her lost treasure. Some months afterwards, being at a party, she recognized the young man seen in her dream, and learned that he was a baker. He took no particular notice of her on that occasion, and I think two years elapsed before she met him again. This second meeting, however, led to an acquaintance, which terminated in marriage. Here the ring and the bread are curiously emblematic of the marriage, and the occupation of the future husband. Miss L., residing at Dalkeith, dreamed that her brother, who was ill, called her to his bedside and gave her a letter which he desired her to carry to their aunt, Mrs. H., with the request that she would deliver it to John. John was another brother who had died previously, and Mrs. H. was at the time ill. He added that he himself was going there also, but Mrs. H. would be there before him. Accordingly, Miss L. went in her dream with the letter to Mrs. H., whom she found dressed in white and looking quite radiant and happy 
She took the letter, saying she was going there directly and would deliver it. On the following morning Miss L. learned that her aunt had died in the night. The brother died some little time afterward. A gentleman who had been a short time visiting Edinburgh was troubled with a cough, which, though it occasioned him no alarm, he resolved to go home to nurse. On the first night of his arrival he dreamed that one half of the house was blown away. His bailiff, who resided at a distance, dreamed the same dream on the same night. The gentleman died within a few weeks. This symbolic language which the deity appears to have used, witness Peter's dream, Acts 2, and others, in all his revelations to man is in the highest degree, what poetry is in a lower, and the language of dreams in the lowest, namely the original natural language of man. And we may fairly ask whether this language, which here plays an inferior part, be not possibly the proper language of a higher sphere, while we, who vainly think ourselves awake, are in reality buried in a deep, deep sleep, in which, like dreamers who imperfectly hear the voices of those around them, we occasionally apprehend, though obscurely, a few words of this divine tongue. Vida Schubert The subject of sleeping and waking is a very curious one, and might give rise to strange questionings. In the case of those patients above mentioned who seem to have two different spheres of existence, who shall say which is the waking one, or whether either of them be so? The speculations of Mr. Dove on this subject merited more attention, I think, than they met with when he lectured in Edinburgh. He maintained that long before he had paid any attention to magnetism, he had arrived at the conclusion that there are as many states or conditions of mind beyond sleep as there are on this side of it. Passing through the different stages of dreaming, reverie, contemplation, etc., up to perfect vigilance. However this be in this world of appearance, where we see nothing as it is, and where both as regards our moral and physical relations, we live in a state of continual delusion, it is impossible for us to pronounce on this question. It is a common remark that some people seem to live in a dream, and never to be quite awake, and the most cursory observer cannot fail to have been struck with examples of persons in this condition, especially in the aged. With respect to this allegorical language, Enemoser observes that since no dreamer learns it of another, and still less from those who are awake, it must be natural to all men. How different, too, is its comprehensiveness and rapidity to our ordinary language. We are accustomed, and with justice, to wonder at the admirable mechanism by which, without fatigue or exertion, we communicate with our fellow beings. But how slow and ineffectual is human speech compared to this spiritual picture language? where a whole history is understood at a glance, and scenes that seem to occupy days and weeks are acted out in ten minutes. It is remarkable that this hieroglyphic language appears to be the same among all people, and that the dream interpreters of all countries construe the signs alike. Thus the dreaming of deep water denotes trouble, and pearls are a sign of tears. I have heard of a lady who, whenever a misfortune was impending, dreamed that she saw a large fish, one night she dreamed that this fish had bitten two of her little boy's fingers. Immediately afterward a schoolfellow of the child injured those two very fingers by striking him with a hatchet, and I have met with several persons who have learned by experience to consider one particular dream as a certain prognostic of misfortune. A lady who had left the West Indies when six years old came one night, fourteen years afterwards, to her sister's bedside and said, I know uncle is dead. I have dreamed that I saw a number of slaves in the large storeroom at Barbados with long brooms, sweeping down immense cobwebs. I complained to my aunt, and she covered her face and said, Yes, he is no sooner gone than they disobey him. It was afterward ascertained that Mr. P. had died on that night, and that he had never permitted the cobwebs in this room to be swept away, of which, however, the lady assures me she knew nothing nor could she or her friends conceive what was meant by the symbol of the cobwebs, till they received the explanation subsequently from a member of the family. The following very curious allegorical dream I give, not in the words of the dreamer, but in those of her son, who bears a name destined, I trust, to a long immortality. Wooers Abbey Cottage, Dunfermline in the Woods, Monday morning, 31st May, 1847. Dear Mrs. Crow, that dream of my mother's was as follows. She stood in a long, dark, empty gallery. On her one side was my father, and on the other my eldest sister Amelia, then myself and the rest of the family according to their ages. At the foot of the hall stood my youngest sister Alexis, and above her my sister Catherine. 
a creature, by the way, in person and mind, more like an angel of heaven than an inhabitant of earth. We all stood silent and motionless. At last it entered, the unimagined something, that casting its grim shadow before had enveloped all the trivialities of the preceding dream in the stifling atmosphere of terror. It entered, stealthily descending the three steps that led from the entrance down into the chamber of horror. And my mother felt it was death. He was dwarfish, bent and shriveled. He carried on his shoulder a heavy axe, and had come, she thought, to destroy all her little ones at one fell swoop. On the entrance of the shape my sister Alexis leaped out of the rank, interposing herself between him and my mother. He raised his axe and aimed a blow at Catherine, a blow which, to her horror, my mother could not intercept, though she had snatched up a three-legged stool, the sole furniture of the apartment, for that purpose. She could not, she felt, fling the stool at the figure without destroying Alexis, who kept shooting out and in between her and the ghastly thing. She tried in vain to scream. She besought my father in agony to avert the impending stroke, but he did not hear or did not heed her, and stood motionless as in a trance. Down came the axe, and poor Catherine fell in her blood, cloven to the white hall Spain. Again the axe was lifted by the inexorable shadow over the head of my brother, who stood next in line. Alexis had somewhere disappeared behind the ghastly visitant, and with a scream my mother flung the footstool at his head. He vanished, and she awoke. This dream left on my mother's mind a fearful apprehension of impending misfortune, which would not pass away. It was murder, she feared, and her suspicions were not allayed by the discovery that a man, some time before discarded by my father for bad conduct, and with whom she had somehow associated the death of her dream, had been lurking about the place and sleeping in an adjoining outhouse on the night it occurred. And for some nights previous and subsequent to it, her terror increased. Sleep forsook her, and every night when the house was still, she arose and stole sometimes with a candle, sometimes in the dark, from room to room listening in a sort of waking nightmare for the breathing of the assassin, who she imagined was lurking in some one of them. This could not last. She reasoned with herself, but her terror became intolerable, and she related her dream to my father, who of course called her a fool for her pains, whatever might be his real opinion of the matter. Three months had elapsed when we children were all of us seized with scarlet fever. My sister Catherine died almost immediately, sacrificed, as my mother in her misery thought, to her, my mother's over-anxiety for Alexis, whose danger seemed more imminent. The dream prophecy was in part fulfilled. I also was at death's door, given up by the doctors, but not by my mother. She was confident of my recovery. But for my brother, who was scarcely considered in danger at all, but on whose head she had seen the visionary axe impending, her fears were great, for she could not recollect whether the blow had or had not descended when the spectre vanished. My brother recovered, but relapsed and barely escaped with life. But Alexis did not. For a year and ten months the poor child lingered, and almost every night I had to sing her to sleep. Often I remember through bitter tears, for I knew she was dying, and I loved her the more as she wasted away. I held her little hand as she died. I followed her to the grave, the last thing that I have loved on earth, and the dream was fulfilled. Truly and sincerely yours, J. Noel Patton the dreaming of coffins and funerals when a death is impending must be considered as examples of this allegorical language. Instances of this kind are extremely numerous. Not unfrequently the dreamer is in cases of second sight sees either the body in the coffin, so as to be conscious of who is to die, or else is made aware of it from seeing the funeral procession at a certain house, or from some other significant circumstance. This faculty, which has been supposed to belong particularly to the Highlanders of Scotland, appears to be fully as well known in Wales and on the continent, especially in Germany. The language of dreams, however, is not always symbolical. Occasionally the scene that is transacting at a distance, or that is to be transacted at some future period, is literally presented to the sleeper as things appear to be presented in many cases of second sight, and also in clairvoyance, and since we suppose him, that is, the sleeper, to be in a temporary magnetic state, we must conclude that the degree of perspicuity or translucency of the vision depends on the degree of that state. Nevertheless, there are considerable difficulties attending this theory. 
a great proportion of the prophetic dreams we hear of are connected with the death of some friend or relative some it is true regard unimportant matters as visits and so forth but this is generally though not exclusively the case only with persons who have a constitutional tendency to this kind of dreaming and with whom it is frequent but it is not uncommon for those who have not discovered any such tendency to be made aware of a death and the number of dreams of this description i meet with is very considerable now it is difficult to conceive what the condition is that causes this perception of an approaching death or why supposing as we have suggested above that when the senses sleep the untrammelled spirit sees the memory of this revelation if i may so call it so much more frequently survives than any other unless indeed it be the force of the shock sustained which shock it is to be remarked always wakes the sleeper and this may be the reason that if he fall asleep again the dream is almost invariably repeated i could fill pages with dreams of this description which have come to my knowledge or been recorded by others Mr. H., a gentleman with whom I am acquainted, a man engaged in active business, and apparently as little likely as any one I ever knew to be troubled with a faculty of this sort, dreamed that he saw a certain friend of his dead. The dream was so like reality that although he had no reason whatever to suppose his friend ill, he could not forbear sending in the morning to inquire for him. The answer returned was that Mr. A. was out and was quite well. The impression, however, was so vivid that although he had nearly three miles to send, Mr. H. felt that he could not start for Glasgow, whether business called him, without making another inquiry. This time his friend was at home and answered for himself that he was very well, and that somebody must have been hoaxing H. and making him believe otherwise. Mr. H. set out on his journey wondering at his own anxiety, but unable to conquer it. He was absent but a few days, I think three and the first news he heard on his return was that his friend had been seized with an attack of inflammation and was dead. A German professor lately related to a friend of mine that being some distance from home he dreamed that his father was dying and was calling for him. The dream being repeated he was so far impressed as to alter his plans and return home, where he arrived in time to receive his parents' last breath. He was informed that the dying man had been calling upon his name repeatedly in deep anguish at his absence. A parallel case to this is that of Mr. R. E. S., an accountant in Edinburgh and a shrewd man of business who relates the following circumstance as occurring to himself. He is a native of Dalkeith and was residing there when being about fifteen years of age he left home on a Saturday to spend a few days with a friend at Preston Pans. On the Sunday night he dreamed that his mother was extremely ill and started out of his sleep with an impression that he must go to her immediately. He even got out of bed with the intention of doing so, but reflecting that he had left her quite well and that it was only a dream, he returned to bed and again fell asleep. But the dream returned, and unable longer to control his anxiety, he arose, dressed himself in the dark, quitted the house, leaping the railings that surrounded it, and made the best of his way to Dalkeith. On reaching home, which he did before daylight, he tapped at the kitchen window and on gaining admittance was informed that on the Saturday evening, after he had departed, his mother had been seized with an attack of British cholera, and was lying above extremely ill. She had been lamenting his absence extremely, and had scarcely ceased crying, Oh, Ralph, Ralph, what a grief that you are away! At nine o'clock he was admitted to her room, but she was no longer in a condition to recognize him, and she died within a day or two. Instances of this sort are numerous, but it would be tedious to narrate them, especially as there is little room for variety in the details. I shall therefore content myself with giving one or two specimens of each class, confining my examples to such as have been communicated to myself, except where any case of particular interest leads me to deviate from this plan. The frequency of such phenomena may be imagined when I mention that the instances I shall give with few exceptions have been collected with little trouble and without seeking beyond my own small circle of acquaintance in the family of the above-named gentleman mr r e s there probably existed a faculty of presentment for in the year eighteen ten his elder brother being assistant surgeon on board the gorgon war brig his father dreamed that he was promoted to the sparrowhawk a ship he had then never heard of neither had the family received any intelligence of the young man for several months he told his dream and was well laughed at for his pains, but in a few weeks a letter arrived announcing the promotion. 
when Lord Burgersh was giving theatrical parties at Florence, a lady, Mrs. M., whose presence was very important, excused herself one evening, being in great alarm from having dreamed in the night that her sister in England was dead, which proved to be the fact. Mr. W., a young man at Glasgow College, not long since, dreamed that his aunt in Russia was dead. He noted the date of his dream on the window-shutter of his chamber. In a short time the news of the lady's death arrived. The dates, however, did not accord, but on mentioning the circumstance to a friend he was reminded that the adherence of the Russians to the old style reconciled the difference. A man of business in Glasgow lately dreamed that he saw a coffin on which was inscribed the name of a friend with the date of his death. Some time afterward he was summoned to attend the funeral of that person, who at the time of the dream was in good health, and he was struck with surprise on seeing the plate of the coffin bearing the very date he had seen in his dream. A French gentleman, Monsieur de V, dreamed some years since that he saw a tomb on which he read very distinctly the following date, 23rd June, 1840-something. There were also some initials, but so much a face that he could not make them out. He mentioned the circumstance to his wife, and for some time they could not help dreading the recurrence of the ominous month. But as year after year passed and nothing happened, they had ceased to think of it when at last the symbol was explained. On the 23rd of June, 1846, their only daughter died at the age of 17. Thus far, the instances I have related seem to resolve themselves into cases of simple clairvoyance or second sight in sleep, although in using these words I am very far from meaning to imply that I explain the thing or unveil its mystery. The theory above alluded to seems as yet the only one applicable to the facts namely that the senses being placed in a negative and passive state the universal sense of the immortal spirit within which sees and hears and knows or rather in one word perceives without organs becomes more or less free to work unclogged that the soul is a mirror in which the spirit sees all things reflected is a modification of this theory but i confess i find myself unable to attach any idea to this latter form of expression another view which i have heard suggested by an eminent person is that if it be true as maintained by dr wigan and some other physiologists that our brains are double it is possible that a polarity may exist between the two sides by means of which the negative side may under certain circumstances become a mirror to the positive it seems difficult to reconcile this notion with the fact that these perceptions occur most frequently when the brain is asleep how far the sleep is perfect in general however we can never know and of course when the powers of speech and locomotion continue to be exercised we are aware that it is only partial in a more or less degree in the case of magnetic sleepers observation shows us that the auditory nerves are aroused by being addressed and fall asleep again as soon as they are left undisturbed in most cases of natural sleep the same process if the voice were heard at all would disperse sleep altogether and it must be remembered that as dr holland says sleep is a fluctuating condition varying from one moment to another and this allowance must be made when considering magnetic sleep also it is by this theory of the duality of the brain which seems to have many arguments in its favor and the alternate sleeping and waking of the two sides that dr wigan seeks to account for the state of double or alternate consciousness above alluded to and also for that strange sensation which most people have experienced of having witnessed a scene or heard a conversation at some indefinite period before, or even in some earlier state of existence. He thinks that one half of the brain, being in a more active condition than the other, it takes cognizance of the scene first, and that thus the perceptions of the second, when they take place, appear to be a repetition of some former experiences. I confess this theory as regards this latter phenomenon is to me eminently unsatisfactory, and it is especially defective in not accounting for one of the most curious particulars connected with it, namely that on these occasions people not only seem to recognize the circumstances as having been experienced before, but that they have very frequently an actual foreknowledge of what will be next said or done. Now the explanation of this mystery, I incline to think, may possibly lie in the hypothesis I have suggested, namely that in profound and what appears to us generally to have been dreamless sleep, we are clear seers. The map of coming events lies open before us, the spirit surveys it, but with the awakening of the sensuous organs, this dream life, with its aerial excursion, passes away and we are translated into our other sphere of existence. 
but occasionally some flash of recollection, some ray of light from this visionary world in which we have been living, breaks in upon our external objective existence, and we recognize the locality, the voice, the very words, as being but a reacting of some foregone scenes of a drama. The faculty of presentment, of which every one must have heard instances, seems to have some affinity to the phenomenon last referred to. I am acquainted with a lady, in whom this faculty is in some degree developed, who has evinced it by a consciousness of the moment when a death was taking place in her family, or among her connections, although she does not know who it is that has departed. I have heard of several cases of people hurrying homeward from a presentment of fire, and Mr. M. of Calderwood was once, when absent from home, seized with such an anxiety about his family, that without being able in any way to account for it, he felt himself impelled to fly to them, and remove them from the house they were inhabiting, one wing of which fell down immediately afterward. No notion of such a misfortune had ever before occurred to him, nor was there any reason whatever to expect it, the accident originating from some defect in the foundations. A circumstance exactly similar to this is related by Stilling of Professor Bohm, teacher of mathematics at Marburg, who being one evening in company was suddenly seized with the conviction that he ought to go home. As, however, he was very comfortably taking his tea and had nothing to do at home, he resisted the admonition, but it returned with such force that at length he was obliged to yield. On reaching his house he found everything as he had left it, but he now felt himself urged to remove his bed from the corner in which it stood to another. But as it had always stood there, he resisted this impulsion also. However, the resistance was vain, absurd as it seemed. He felt he must do it. So he summoned the maid, and with her aid drew the bed to the other side of the room, after which he felt quite at ease and returned to spend the rest of the evening with his friends. At ten o'clock the party broke up, and he retired home and went to bed and to sleep. In the middle of the night he was awakened by a loud crash, and on looking out he saw that a large beam had fallen, bringing part of the ceiling with it, and was lying exactly on the spot his bed had occupied. A young servant girl in this neighborhood, who had been several years in an excellent situation, where she was much esteemed, was suddenly seized with a presentment that she was wanted at home, and in spite of all representations she resigned her place and set out on her journey thither, where when she arrived she found her parents extremely ill, one of them mortally and in the greatest need of her services. No intelligence of their illness had reached her, nor could she herself in any way account for the impulse. I have heard of numerous well-authenticated cases of people escaping drowning from being seized with unaccountable presentment of evil, where there were no external signs whatever to justify the apprehension. The story of Cousat, as related by La Harpe, is a very remarkable instance of this sort of faculty, and seems to indicate a power like that possessed by Zichok, who relates in his autobiography that frequently while conversing with a stranger the whole circumstances of that person's previous life were revealed to him even comprising details of places and persons. In the case of Gazad, it was the future that was laid open to him, and he foretold to a company of eminent persons in the year 1788 the fate which awaited each individual, himself included, in consequence of the revolution then commencing. As this story is already in print, I forbear to relate it. One of the most remarkable cases of presentment I know is that which occurred not very long since on board of one of Her Majesty's ships, when lying off Portsmouth. The officers being one day at the mess-table, young Lieutenant P. suddenly laid down his knife and fork, pushed away his plate, and turned extremely pale. He then rose from the table, covering his face with his hands, and retired from the room. The president of the mess, supposing him to be ill, sent one of the young men to inquire what was the matter. At first Mr. P. was unwilling to speak, but on being pressed he confessed that he had been seized by a sudden and irresistible impression that her brother he had then in India was dead. He died, said he, on the 12th of August at six o'clock. I am perfectly certain of it. No arguments could overthrow this conviction, which in due course of post was verified to the letter. The young man had died at Cawnpore at the precise period mentioned. When any exhibition of this sort of faculty occurs in animals, which is by no means unfrequent, it is termed instinct, and we look upon it as what it probably is only another and more rare development of that intuitive knowledge which enables them to seek their food and perform the other functions necessary for the maintenance of their existence and the continuance of their race. 
Now it is remarkable that the life of an animal is a sort of dream life. Their ganglionic system is more developed than that of man, and the cerebral less. And since it is doubtless from the greater development of the ganglionic system in women that they exhibit more frequent instances of such abnormal phenomena as I am treating of, than men, we may be perhaps justified in considering the faculty of presentment in a human being as a suddenly awakened instinct, just as in an animal it is intensified instinct. Everybody has either witnessed or heard of instances of this sort of presentment in dogs especially. For the authenticity of the following anecdote I can vouch, the traditions being very carefully preserved in the family concerned, from whom I have it. In the last century Mr. P., a member of this family, who had involved himself in some of the stormy affairs of this northern part of the island, was one day surprised by seeing a favorite dog that was lying at his feet, start suddenly up and seize him by the knee, which he pulled, not with violence, but in a manner that indicated a wish that his master should follow him to the door. The gentleman resisted the invitation for some time, till at length, the perseverance of the animal rousing his curiosity, he yielded and was thus conducted by the dog into the most sequestered part of a neighboring thicket, where, however, he could see nothing to account for his dumb friend's proceeding, who now lay himself down quite satisfied and seemed to wish his master to follow his example, which, determined to pursue the adventure and find out if possible what was meant, he did. A considerable time now elapsed before the dog would consent to his master's going home, but at length he arose and led the way thither, when the first news Mr. P. heard was that a party of soldiers had been there in quest of him, and he was shown the marks of their spikes which had been thrust through the bedclothes in their search. He fled and ultimately escaped, his life being thus preserved by his dog. Some years ago at Plymouth I had a brown spaniel that regularly with great delight accompanied my son and his nurse in their morning's walk. One day she came to complain to me that Tiger would not go out with them. Nobody could conceive the reason of so unusual a caprice, and unfortunately we did not yield to it but forced him to go. In less than a quarter of an hour he was brought back so torn to pieces by a savage dog that had just come ashore from a foreign vessel, that it was found necessary to shoot him immediately. End of section 4. Recording by Philip Gould.